terrorism is the deliberate use of violence aimed against civilian targets by non-state actors in order to achieve political, ideological, religious goals. That's it. So it necessary has to use violence because if it's not a violent act, it's not terrorism. It's by non-state actors. One would say, wait a minute, why do you exclude, exclude state? Can't they do those atrocities like those terrorist organizations? Of course they can. But I don't need to define <clears throat> deliberate use of violence by state against civilian targets as terrorism because it's already being defined by the international humanitarian law as a war crime. And terrorism is the equivalent of a war crime, but this is being done by non-state actors and not by states. Welcome to Frank Talk. I'm Albert Dadon, your host. Today, my guest in Israel is uh, Professor Boaz Ganor. Uh, Professor Ganor has been uh, with the dialogue since the inception in, back in 2009 and has already been once uh, on the Frank Talk. Welcome, uh, Boaz. Thank you very much for having me, Albert. And Boaz, although m most people uh, viewing this program would know who you are, do you mind reintroducing yourself and uh, explaining in particular what you're doing in the area of anti-terror? Sure. Uh, well, uh, after a short service uh, at the uh, Israeli army dealing uh, with uh, counterterrorism, I found this subject matter as very interesting because uh, I will think about any academic discipline that you have in mind and you would find relevancy to terrorism, psychology, sociology, political science, law, criminology. So I decided in my elderly life to focus on terrorism. I had to choose between being a terrorist or a counter-terrorist. And uh, leave aside the moral question, I decided to become a counter-terrorist. I established uh, at the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya the uh, ICT, the International Policy Institute for Counterterrorism, uh, about 25 years ago. And since then, I'm uh, the director of the institute and I'm uh, uh, doing a lot of academic work together with consulting for decision makers uh, around the world. And uh, I find it uh, a very interesting uh, subject matter to deal with. So, uh, Boaz, Recently, to be precise, on the 4th of August, uh, there was a huge explosion in Beirut. Uh, do you know much about it? Well, uh, first of all, uh, we know uh, that this was one of the worst atrocities, uh, not just in Lebanon, but I would say in the Middle East for many, many years. Um, the, uh, the official claim uh, that this, this uh, uh, type of uh, ammonium nitrate was neglected uh, and actually people forgot about it and it was uh, stored uh, in a storage uh, in the port of Beirut. Um, I personally tend to find it very difficult to believe that uh, such an amount of uh, explosives uh, were there without at least the knowledge, if not more than that, of, uh, of Hezbollah. Um, and uh, Hezbollah is trying actually to clear itself from any connection uh, to this uh, blast uh, and, uh, and the ramification of the blast. Uh, they uh, are standing against any international inquiry uh, that would come to the truth. And uh, they are investing their time in A, in denying the responsibility or connection to that uh, attack, and B, in uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, support uh, the victims uh, and, uh, and uh, show as if uh, they are bringing in uh, Iranian money in order to, uh, to, support, uh, to support that. Um, right now, uh, there are no official uh, explanation uh, what exactly uh, caused that. It seems like a malfunction, um, but uh, again, if you ask my personal belief, I think that at least uh, Hezbollah uh, known about that. Uh, bear in mind that this specific type of explosives, uh, which is based on fertilizer, but very dangerous one, is being used on a regular basis by Hezbollah activists all over the world. 
uh, in their terrorist attacks. Uh, not long ago, there was a storage of this ammonium nitrate that was uh, uh, captured in London, a few tons of ammonium nitrate, uh, another storage in, uh, in Cyprus, uh, um, another storage uh, a few years ago in Thailand. So this is, uh, this is a well-known fertilizer which is used for IEDs, improvised explosive device, uh, as a terrorist uh, 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 material. Uh, and this, uh, this is the type of the material that was uh, blowing up in, in the port of Beirut. Hello everyone, thank you for watching Frank Talk. And if you are watching us on YouTube or Facebook, please hit the subscribe button. Don't forget to leave us a comment. If you are listening to us on the podcast, give us a five star review and a comment. And I won't take any more of your time. Let's go back to the show. So what I hear, uh, well, first of all, uh, let me give you my source. It's uh, simply Wikipedia. There is a page on Wikipedia about what happened there. And according to Wikipedia, uh, this is uh, um, a, a cargaison, a cargo uh, that was in transit in Beirut, and it was on the way somewhere. Now, another source that I found in a French website says that it was en route for Mozambique. And uh, apparently the, the cargo was coming from the Ukraine. It was in a vessel owned by a Ukrainian, but flying a Panamanian flag. And um, the vessel, when it stops, uh, when it stopped in Beirut, uh, the authorities there found that the vessel was not uh, safe uh, for navigation, confiscated it, or in fact didn't let it go out of the port, and uh, the owner then abandoned the cargo. That's the story succinctly that is reported on Wikipedia. Now, another source, because we, we have uh, uh, many sources here. <laughs> One of my Lebanese friends tells me that um, this um, was stored in a warehouse in the port, uh, warehouse number 22, to be verified. I don't know if you heard about this. And that warehouse is owned by Hezbollah. Yeah, I know the official, the official story that involves almost every nation on earth. We have Mozambiques, we have Ukrainians, we have Lebanese, we have everything. I find it very, very difficult to accept that uh, it's... Uh, it's uh, I, I don't know the Lebanese as uh, uh, the best uh, regulatory administration in the world that when they see a ship that it's not safe enough, uh, they don't want to let uh, this ship to travel in the open sea. And instead of that, they keep the ship in a, a Beirut port with uh, an enormous amount of uh, explosives uh, and, and they let it stay there for years uh, practically. So, you know, I'm not a great believer in conspiracy theories, uh, but this story, uh, I find it very difficult to, uh, to accept. Yes, I mean, although in third world countries, which uh, unfortunately Lebanon has become 50% of its population before COVID even hit, uh, was uh, under the poverty line. As you know, they had economical crisis. They were going from one crisis to the next. They couldn't even get their money from their bank accounts anymore. It was all frozen. I mean, it, the, the country is in chaos, uh, uh, Boaz. You wouldn't give them that uh, the benefit of that doubt? No, uh, the country is in chaos. Uh, there is almost one element in Lebanon that uh, has a very clear uh, scale, a chain of command uh, um, working uh, to achieve the goals uh, step by step and actually uh, uh, gaining uh, more and more uh, influence on the country. And this is uh, Hezbollah, a terrorist organization that practically took over the state. Uh, the Lebanese government, the previous one and probably the, com the, the one that they would build uh, right now after the, the recent one was resigning, uh, this uh, government was constructed uh, 
uh, if not by Hezbollah, as at least by the permission of Hezbollah, in which uh, quite, quite large of uh, seats in the parliament and in the government itself are designated for Hezbollah, uh, Hezbollah activists and Hezbollah leaders. Um, so yes, the country by itself is down the drains. The uh, economic uh, situation is disastrous. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> the uh, Lebanese uh, currency um, is suffering a lot uh, uh, and, and it's uh, becoming almost uh, useless. Uh, the uh, coronavirus uh, has its own impact and now the uh, bombing in, in uh, in the port, uh, which caused a, a disaster uh, situation. The government has no way uh, to, uh, to deal with that without external support, and the external support uh, is, uh, is not coming uh, uh, in, in a large amount because of the fact that this state is being run today by a terrorist organization. I, and I think that if uh, the Lebanese would, would just... Uh, 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 think what is best for them, they would get rid uh, with the uh, Hezbollah as a whole, with the influence of, of Hezbollah on their internal politics and their economy and every, every part of, uh, of Lebanon. And then they will come back and become uh, 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 res responsible and respected members of the international society. And they will get the help of the international community to get over this uh, enormous crisis. I, I don't want to uh, go too deep in the Hezbollah subject yet because mm -hmm. I, I want to see something that unfolded very early uh, uh, after the explosion is uh, that many people around Europe, uh, even in Australia, started to trying to put this on the back of Israel. You've heard about this. I heard about this, uh, you know, uh, in brackets, uh, anti-Semitism never disappears from Earth. Uh, you have the traditional uh, anti-Semitists that blame, uh, used to blame everything that, every bad thing that happened in the world on the Jew, on, on Jews. And you have the modern anti-Semitists that they blame Israel in every possible conspiracy in the world. But what is really interesting to see that even Hezbollah itself didn't uh, uh, start to blame Israel because they know the truth. Uh, not that they stick to the truth, but at least in that case, they didn't even dare uh, to hint that Israel has anything to do with that because it's very, uh, very easy to refute that. Uh, this is, in the best case scenario, an outcome of uh, uh, irresponsible behavior of the Lebanese government, including Hezbollah element within the Lebanese government, and the worst case scenario, a direct responsibility of the organization. Um, so this is uh, just nonsense to uh, to try to blame Israel. Yeah, to, to me, I, I wouldn't be uh, going all the way to the anti-Semitism because the people that made those allegations, they're the usual culprits, pro-Palestinians, anti-Israel, um, they're opportunists that uh, they would blame Israel for anything and everything that happens in the Middle East, uh, whether their sentiments are anti-Semites or whether they are uh, too in love with their own ideas. Uh, I, I don't know. It's wishful thinking. And of course, that made no sense because Israel tried immediately to send some humanitarian aid to Lebanon, which aid that was refused. They prefer the Chilean aid uh, instead. But in any event, uh, so I want to go back all the way to the start, because many people watching this, uh, Boaz, have no clue as oh, who is Hezbollah. They have no clue about what you're saying when you say it's a terrorist organization and so on. To me, my research takes me in a different journey. I think it's much bigger, much, much bigger than a terror organization. It's actually also a narcotic um, uh, uh, organization. It's a, it's a drug cartel. Uh, it's uh, creating devastations around many other countries. But I want to, to go back to the inception of Hezbollah. 
what was happening, when was it happening, who initiated it, who was behind it. Let's start from the basics, please. Thank you, uh, Albert. Um, so I need to take you uh, to travel in time uh, to the late 70s. Uh, in the late 70s, Iran uh, have experienced an internal revolution. The uh, uh, Falhavi uh, uh, regime um, was actually uh, uh, removed uh, in an internal revolution that was led by uh, the Shiite Islamist elements, the Ayatollahs, uh, with the leader uh, Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini. Now, um, once Khomeini took over the state, they changed their attitude towards the whole world, I would say, including Israel, because before that, Israel and Iran was uh, uh, very close allies. Um, uh, but after uh, Khomeini took over in late 70s, uh, he uh, disconnected uh, the diplomatic relations with, uh, with Israel. And uh, at the same time, he actually brought to the table uh, a very important uh, strategic concept that is uh, leading the Iranian uh, behavior in, uh, in the international arena until this very moment. And he calls that exporting the revolution. The term is exporting the revolution. The idea of Khomeini was not only that we will change the nature of Iran from a, a, a democratic uh, uh, state into uh, Islamic Republic, Shiite Islamic Republic, we will bring this change to the whole world. Uh, this is the exporting of the revolution. But he was uh, a very smart person. He understood that he cannot actually uh, change the world at once. So he decided to do it stage by stage. Uh, and at first, he wanted to focus uh, on states or in states that has a majority of Shiites uh, or at least a large uh, minority of Shiites, which he could uh, cling to them, rely on them, and cause a chain of revolutions in those countries. When he was looking around, he saw that the best place for, uh, uh, for that uh, policy uh, would be Lebanon. And uh, at that time, in Lebanon, there was another... Uh, they had, as they have today, a large uh, Shiite uh, community. It's not a majority, it's a minority, but still a very large one, uh, that was controlled by another organization, which was called AMAL. Um, AMAL was a political uh, uh, party with uh, some uh, military uh, presence, but definitely not uh, involved in terrorist uh, attacks. And, um, and Khomeini was not satisfied with Khomeini, by the way, built a whole very strong, maybe the strongest Iranian apparatus for this, for this purpose, which is called the Revolutionary Guards. The Revolutionary Guards was meant to uh, identify those elements, those organizations in different countries, support them, train them, and actually lead the way for internal subversion that would, at the end of the day, end in an internal revolt and taking over the regime. The first case, the most important one, was Lebanon, the Shiite community, and for that purpose, they created Hezbollah. So Hezbollah is an Iranian creature that was created in Lebanon, trying to deceive the whole world, especially the Lebanese themselves and the rest of the world, as if this is an authentic uh, Lebanese Shiite organization. Yes, it's based on uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, ethnic uh, uh, Shiite uh, in Lebanon, but they are totally controlled by Iran. They are being sponsored by Iran. All their enormous uh, uh, military arsenal, which is unprecedented to any other organization in the world, even not states in many cases, is being brought to them by uh, Iran, and they are being used as a proxy by Iran for the interest and the purposes of, uh, of Iran in many parts of the world, by the way, they used Hezbollah and they used Hezbollah uh, for uh, supporting Assad regime in Syria for about four years, since 1911 and, uh, 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 until uh, the end of the civil war in Syria. 
and uh, also they use them uh, uh, for subversion activity in, in Yemen, uh, in Iraq, uh, as they do with other Shiite militias uh, uh, all over the world. And they used them in the past and will use them in the future, I believe, for terrorist purposes, uh, conducting attacks that uh, uh, actually promote the interest of Iran and the interest of Hezbollah all over the world. Uh, it's interesting that you say that the Syrian uh, civil war uh, is over. Uh, I thought it was still going on. When was it over? Well, uh, I, think it's, I think it's quite clear that uh, ISIS uh, was defeated. Uh, ISIS was defeated in Syria, although we still have elements there um, attacking from time to time, but as a whole, uh, from that uh, point of view, ISIS lost the war. By the way, ISIS lost the war not because of the Americans, although they brag about that, not because of the Israelis, uh, not because of any Western state, because the, what I call <clears throat> the axis of evil was created in order to uh, eradicate this uh, terrible organization in, uh, in Syria, not because they wanted uh, uh, to have a better world, because they wanted to preserve the notorious regime of Assad staying in power in Syria. And this axis of evil, evil was led by Iran, was constructed by uh, Iranian elements, Shiite militias, but mainly Hezbollah, with the support of Turkey, another uh, 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 villain uh, in the region, and getting the overall uh, uh, support of, uh, of Russia. Uh, and, uh, and, and this... Uh, this and don't forget the Kurds, of course. Don't forget the Kurds. They had a major role in the, defeating the... The Kurds actually was more... Um, working with the Americans uh, and getting the American support and was less cooperated with this axis of evil. So in the territory that the Kurds controlled, they had an important impact. But bear in mind that the Kurds territory in Syria is mainly the northern part, or should I say the eastern northern part of Syria. There they had an impact. In other parts of Syria, they have no impact. And the axis of evil was actually mainly the uh, element that uh, uh, caused the defeat of, uh, of ISIS. I, of course, I see it in a good eye that ISIS was defeated, but I see it in a very bad eye that this axis of evil uh, was winning the war because I don't see the Assad regime together with the uh, strategic cooperation that they have with uh, uh, Hezbollah, Shiite militia, and of course Iran, uh, as a better uh, uh, creature uh, compared to ISIS, maybe even more dangerous than ISIS. Yeah. So uh, back to Hezbollah and the Iranian connection, uh, I believe that uh, Hezbollah is connected to the revolutionary guards of Iran. As I said, the uh, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini built the revolutionary guards as an infrastructure for that purpose. The idea was that this would be the main element to export the revolution all over the world. So uh, the Revolutionary Guard is responsible to identify uh, Shiite uh, elements in different countries around the world, to connect with them, to uh, train them, to support them, uh, to uh, lead them and guide them. Uh, in their subversion activity in their countries and to use them for terrorist purposes uh, to promote Iranian interests wherever they are or in other uh, uh, parts of, of, uh, of the world. The Revolutionary Guards prefer to use those Shiite uh, uh, proxies uh, and mainly Hezbollah for that purpose because by that he is not uh, taking direct responsibility uh, for, those, uh, for those specific atrocities. So now fast forward, or before we fast forward, one thing that you, maybe you, I didn't hear you mention is that uh, Hezbollah is also one of the major role of Hezbollah is to be used by Iran as a proxy war against Israel in the north of Israel. Yeah, of course, um, that 
one of the main reasons why Hezbollah is the most important uh, element in this uh, global Shiite uh, Revolutionary Guards uh, network uh, is not just the fact that uh, uh, Lebanon was uh, serving as a very good platform for building this type of proxy, but also because this gave Iran an immediate home front uh, and uh, actually a border, if you wish, Iranian border uh, in the north of Israel with uh, one of the biggest enemies of the state. Uh, you know, the Iranians refers to United States as the big Satan and to Israel as the small Satan. Well, uh, that, that's, the, that's the terminology that they use for that purpose. And they wanted to build uh, as a, a threat, a strategic threat to Israel in the northern border, and unfortunately, they succeeded. We are talking uh, about a few decades of effort. As we speak right now, Hezbollah is holding an arsenal of 150,000 rockets and missiles that actually uh, um, reach every part of Israel. <clears throat> and when the time will come, and uh, if and when the Iranians would, yet, would like to use this arsenal, because listen to that, this is an Iranian arsenal in the hands of Hezbollah. When they would want to use that, they can uh, cause an enormous destruction in Israel, uh, uncomparable to any war that Israel had in the past. Some people refer to that as if uh, 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 Israel suffered from an atomic blast without uh, the radioactive impact, but the destruction would be no less than that. Um, this is an unprecedented threat to Israel or maybe to any other state in the world. And this is meant for different purposes, A, to threaten Israel, and B, uh, uh, to attack Israel if, uh, if needed, and C, maybe I should start with that, to deter Israel from challenging Iran itself, and especially from attacking the nuclear uh, uh, efforts of uh, Iran to reach a nuclear bomb in Iran itself. And uh, the equation that they uh, created was saying, if you would attack our facilities, we would unleash uh, Hezbollah with this enormous arsenal uh, that would uh, cause an unprecedented uh, destruction and, and casualties in Israel. So, Boaz, can we try to define uh, the Hezbollah organization? Because it's got many arms, like uh, nearly 40 years, or over 40 years, I should say, later, after its inception, it's a bit like an octopus. It's got many tentacles. And uh, some of them are charitable, and usually some of the countries who are resisting uh, to ban Hezbollah uh, refer to those tentacles as an excuse for not banning the whole organization. So can you f define for us uh, the external arm, the, the, the militia, I mean, there is uh, the political arm, there is so many, but I'd like to hear it from you uh, if there is... Uh, such a thing as a, as a list, if there is a, an exhaustive list. Thank you for asking, uh, Albert, because, you know, in, in the scholarly community, I'm being, I'm being regarded as the uh, freak of definitions. Um, and, and why do I say that? Uh, because I see uh, as, as the uh, nucleus problem, the problem of definition. And I refer to the definition of terrorism. And let me go back to that embryonic idea, what is, what is terrorism? And from that, I will build uh, upon what is Hezbollah. I, I absolutely love that. I remember you exposing this to me once before, but I, I, go ahead. So happy to, to share that with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. You know, if you would ask your friends, your viewers, your listeners, um, if it's possible to define terrorism, most of them would say, of course not. It's impossible. This is a subjective term. And I'm sure you heard many, many times over and over again uh, the slogan, which sounds uh, like a, a, a legitimate one, but I uh, beg to differ. Uh, the slogan is saying one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. 
as if it's all about perspectives. Uh, if you fight against me, you're a terrorist. If you fight, fight against my enemy, you're a freedom fighter. Very convenient situation, by the way, for, for all the world and, and all the nations, not just for terrorist supporters. Even for liberal democratic states, the fact that there is no objective definition of the term. So the first thing they say, uh, we cannot define. The second thing that uh, most of the people would say, and decision makers around the world, we don't need to define terrorism because we all know what is terrorism is all about. It's uh, just show it to me and I will tell you this is terrorism or not. It's so natural. And I beg to differ on both cases. I would argue that A, it's possible to define terrorism and it's needed, it's crucial to define terrorism because without that, we live a blurred situation in which everybody can play uh, and promote any interest they want, uh, referring to this organization as a terrorist organization and to the other is not. And that, of course, uh, reflects uh, Hezbollah designation as a terrorist organization as well. So now let's try to understand what is terrorism. The definition that I use for terrorism is a very, very uh, simple and short definition. Terrorism, terrorism is the deliberate use of violence aimed against civilian targets by non-state actors in order to achieve political, ideological, religious goals. That's it. So it necessary has to use violence because if it's not a violent act, it's not terrorism. It's by non-state actors. One would say, wait a minute, why do you exclude, exclude state? Can't they do those atrocities like those terrorist organizations? Of course they can. But I don't need to define <clears throat> the liberties of violence by state against civilian targets as terrorism because it's already being defined by the international humanitarian law as a war crime. And terrorism is the equivalent of a war crime. But this is being done by non-state actors and not by states. And then I'm saying that it has a political or a ideological or religious goals that they're trying to achieve. Because if not, if it's just economical profit, this is a criminal activity and not terrorist activity. Terrorists and criminals are doing the same, but the grievances and the, uh, the interests are different. And last but not least is uh, that they do it as a deliberate attack against civilian targets. I do not refer to deliberate attack against military targets as terrorism. I refer to that as guerrilla warfare, insurgency. Of course, anybody who attacks my uh, uh, army is my enemy. I have all the right in the world to fight back uh, against this organization. But this is not the problem of the international community. And I would like to argue that the problem of the international community is every non-state actor that deliberately attacks civilians, i.e. every terrorist. Regardless, by the way, if you support the grievances, if you support their goals, if you think that they have a legitimate cause, it has nothing to do with that. Terrorism is an, an illegal uh, um, uh, modus operandi. Now, the slogan, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, is a misleading slogan because what does it tell us? That uh, if you're a freedom fighter, you can do everything you want in the world. Of course, we, we can argue, are, is Hezbollah our freedom fighters? Is Hamas freedom fighters? Is Al-Qaeda freedom fighters? Is ISIS freedom fighters? We can argue. Some people see them as freedom fighters, others don't. But we should all agree that even if you are being regarded by me as a freedom fighter, and you have a legitimate cause, and I want to support you, I would not support you if you deliberately attack civilians, i.e. if you're a terrorist organization. And that's what I would expect from every civilized state and leader around the world to say very clearly and very uh, 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 precisely in reference to Hezbollah as well. By the Thank way, you. That's, that's a very clear definition. It's the clearest uh, you can ever uh, uh, come up with. Thank, th thank you, Albert. Uh, let me just now use that in order to refer to Hezbollah. But may I, mm. may I, may I uh, ask you one sure, thing, please. following your logic, sure. Hezbollah now, we all say it's in control of Lebanon. So given that now Hezbollah and Lebanon seem to be one and the same, uh, wouldn't then, uh, your, following your logic, uh, wouldn't you say that now they are uh, um, committing war crimes and actually it's the Lebanese government that's responsible for that? Very good question. Well, Hezbollah 
is not uh, uh, equivalent or equal to Lebanon today. Thanks God. It's going that way. It's as close as possible. But still you can differ between Hezbollah as an organization and Lebanon government that has Hezbollah elements within the government. Now, let me uh, uh, suggest a term that will help to understand. When we talk about organizations, terrorist organizations, we have here a continuum that starts with a very small organization, if you wish a cell, and becomes a larger organization, a big organization. And then you would find organization which we refer to them, and this is Hezbollah, a hybrid terrorist organization. What's a hybrid terrorist organization? A hybrid terrorist organization is a terrorist organization that control territory and population. And as such, a hybrid terrorist organization creates different branches. It, ha it has the terrorist branch. It has its military branch. It has its political branch. It has its social branch. Now, it doesn't delude from the fact that this is a terrorist organization because it deliberately attacks civilians in different uh, 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 areas at different times uh, for different purposes. And it's non-state organization. But it has also other activities which are pseudo-legitimate activities. Uh, 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 um, creating uh, uh, um, charities, uh, creating a political party, and so on and so forth. Some people around the world are misled by that or actually cling to that in order to uh, turn a blind eye to the terrorist nature of the organization. And they say, wait a minute, this is a legitimate organization. They help orphans and, uh, and, and widows. Yes, by the way, if you check which orphan and, uh, and widows are being supported by the charities of Hezbollah, you would see that those are the kids and the wives of Shahids, those suicide attackers uh, that conducted terrorist attacks against civilian uh, uh, targets in Syria, in other parts of the world altogether. So uh, don't confuse that. Uh, sh 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 Shahid is a martyr. Shahid is a martyr. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, a, a nice word to, de to describe a suicide attacker. Uh, the terrorists do not refer, the terrorist organization, all of them, uh, including Hezbollah, or mainly Hezbollah, do not refer to suicide attackers as, uh, as terrorists or, or, or suicide attackers. They refer to them as shaheeds, as martyrs, as people that were ready to sacrifice their life for a greater cause in order to fulfill a divine command, the fatwa, um, altogether. Uh, and they feel responsible to support the families of those shahids to kill innocent civilians. We see it in Hamas, we see it in Palestine Islamic Jihad, we see it in Hezbollah and other terrorist organizations. And they build charities in order to uh, uh, collect the money uh, and fundraise for so-called pseudo-legitimate purposes, but at the end of the day, it's uh, to support uh, the terrorist activity. Uh, tell me what you know about Project Cassandra. What does that uh, ring the bell for? This is, uh, this is uh, uh, one of those uh, uh, projects that uh, uh, the organization uh, is engaged, uh, this was revealed, in different parts of the world. Um, Hezbollah uh, on top, and, and you mentioned that in the opening of, uh, of, of our discussion today, uh, Hezbollah, on top of being a terrorist organization, hybrid terrorist organization, on top of being a, a political party in Lebanon, on top of having members in the parliament and having members in the government, on top of building uh, social infrastructure, Hezbollah is a very large cross border criminal organization, international criminal organization. We see uh, Hezbollah activists, Hezbollah supporters uh, in uh, different parts of the world. We see it in, uh, in uh, Europe, in uh, United States, in Canada, in Africa, in Asian countries, and in Australia, um, being engaged in criminal activity, starting from petite crime, and moving to organized uh, uh, criminal activity uh, that involves uh, large quantities of drugs, 
um, involving uh, roots of uh, co uh, counterfeited medicines, um, uh, smuggling goods, uh, uh, money laundering, and so on and so forth. And this is uh, uh, practically uh, um, bringing income uh, to the organization. Uh, Hezbollah uh, income is coming from different sources. They get hundreds of millions of dollars uh, a year from Iran, from the Revolutionary Guards. They, uh, uh, they demand taxes uh, from um, uh, Lebanese uh, uh, Shiites and others. Uh, they uh, ask slash demand uh, support uh, and they fundraise uh, from Lebanese uh, uh, communities around the world, uh, by the way, including uh, uh, Australia. And, uh, uh, and they uh, bring a large sum of uh, money uh, from criminal activity that they conduct in, uh, in different parts of the world. So uh, this is one example of, uh, of those uh, um, criminal networks that have been exposed by local authorities. I believe that uh, also the project Cassandra uh, that was uh, a codename project uh, that was given uh, under the Obama administration for investigating the nefarious activities of Hezbollah in the United States and South America. And uh, I believe that when Obama was negotiating with Iran, his uh, now infamous uh, nuclear deal, uh, he took that off the table. I mean, the timing was perfect because it was exactly at the time where he shut down that investigation. Yeah, we see time and again, unfortunately. You're right on that. <clears throat> but this is a pattern that repeats itself. Uh, let me take you back to the 80s. Uh, the, uh, excuse me, the 90s. The, uh, probably one of the worst terrorist attacks that have been conducted by Hezbollah was in Latin America. I refer to 1992 the uh, car bomb and the suicide attackers that blasted the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires. And two years after that, in 1994, another car bomb with the suicide attacker, uh, a Hezbollah activist, uh, that blew up the uh, Jewish community house in Buenos Aires as well. Yeah. And it was, it was quite clear. I mean, uh, you would ask uh, any person in, uh, in, in, in uh, Argentina, who was responsible for that, and they immediately would say this was Hezbollah uh, getting the support of the Revolutionary Guards uh, and the permission and the lead of Iran for that purpose. And they started the uh, uh, investigation, and uh, suddenly the investigation had uh, stopped because the, uh, uh, the judge that was responsible for the uh, investigation, Nisman, well, he committed suicide. He jumped from his uh, balcony uh, uh, and he committed suicide. Uh, nonsense. Uh, it's quite clear that he was killed a few hours before he gave, uh, he was planned to giving his speech with all the evidence that shows the Iranian connection for that purpose. Now, you, it's not enough. Let's go back to two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, there was the Hariri verdict by the uh, uh, International Court in Hague. Well, in 2005, somebody killed uh, Hariri, the Prime Minister of, uh, of uh, uh, Lebanon, by putting, uh, again, a, a car bomb with a suicide attacker next to uh, the place that he was uh, staying. He, was, he died. Uh, in, in 2011, uh, the International Court in Hague started uh, the, uh, a, a lawsuit, filed a lawsuit against few people, including or mainly against the chief of staff of Hezbollah, uh, Mustafa Badr Eddin, the one who's responsible for all the military terrorist activity of Hezbollah. He's, he's the liaison between Iran and Hezbollah, he was the one that was replacing Imad Mourania, the most notorious terrorist uh, uh, ever after Bin Laden, probably, uh, and maybe Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And uh, they started to, they, they filed a lawsuit. And you know what happened? Probably you won't be surprised. He had a meeting uh, planned with Qasem Soleimani uh, in, uh, in uh, 2015, if I'm not mistaken, in Damascus. 
Qasim Soleimani, the head of the Revolutionary Guard, actually his boss. He had a meeting with him, and half an hour after the meeting ended, somebody shot his head and assassinated him in Damascus uh, uh, immediately after this specific meeting. Well, I don't know who did that, but I would say this is the most convenient ever uh, 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 activity that happened to Hezbollah in Iran, because by that, actually, they took out the one person that could uh, show the direct connection of Hezbollah and Iran to the assassination of Hariri. And sure enough, the uh, uh, International C uh, Criminal Court in Haag two weeks ago didn't find, but in the verdict, didn't find a direct connection to the leadership of Hezbollah. Why? Because they dismissed the, the lawsuit against the, the, the person that died, uh, uh, Qasem Soleimani. They, uh, they find one of the activists of Hezbollah responsible for that killing, but they don't see the connection to the leadership of Hezbollah or Syria or Iran on that matter. This is a pattern that goes back and, and forth because it's very convenient for the international community. I, I, don't, I don't blame just Iran or Hezbollah for that. I blame the Western society, the Western community, that it's uncomfortable for them to expose the Iranian uh, axis, to expose the Iranian responsibility, to expose the Hezbollah responsibility for these atrocities all over the world. And they find different types of loops uh, uh, in order uh, to give them the benefit of doubt time and again. But uh, maybe uh, uh, there is karma because Suleimani is no more thanks to Trump. Um, I believe it's thanks to him, but uh, maybe thanks to someone else. Um, there is also another uh, project that the Americans are embarking upon and uh, it's uh, run by the Drag Enforcement Administration. Uh, it's a project called uh, Operation Sedar. Do you know anything about it? Well, it's, it's one operation among a series of operations that expose actually the network, uh, the criminal network that goes back to Hezbollah uh, in American territory especially in drug dealing, but as I said before, not just drug dealing, also, uh, also uh, um, counterfeited medicines and uh, smuggling uh, goods from one state to another state, from Canada uh, to, uh, to uh, United States and from different states in, uh, in uh, United States itself. The activity of those elements, those criminal networks in the uh, United States is huge. Uh, and uh, they make a fortune out of it and they pay always some kind of uh, tax, if you wish, or parts of their income uh, to Hezbollah. And, and Hezbollah uh, enjoy, enjoy twice because A, it, uh, it uh, uh, fundle. Uh, a lot of money to the organization, and B, the criminal activity itself and the drug dealing uh, uh, activity in, uh, in uh, uh, United States is another way to fight the big Satan, the way they describe United States uh, for that uh, purpose. This is why the DEA uh, uh, is very much involved in those types of activities. I have to say that we had uh, DEA uh, uh, agents coming to our ICT conferences and uh, having those discussions with our experts on uh, Hezbollah and the connection between the FBI and the DEA uh, in regard to the uh, uh, terrorist and criminal activity in the United States is, uh, is widely known. Uh, that tax that you are referring to is an interesting one. There is a, an Iranian fatwa uh, that uh, um, it's called ALMS, A-L-M-S, that it is a fatwa that, that uh, asks every Shiat, I believe, around <coughs> the world to pay a tax to Hezbollah. You aware of that? Yes. Um, uh, it's more than asking, actually. Uh, just, uh, 
just uh, try to be a, a Shiite and participate in a certain uh, Shiite mosque and refuse to, uh, to pay this uh, donation or, 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 or tax to, uh, to Hezbollah. In many cases, this activity, as I said before, is being camouflaged as uh, uh, supporting charities, as a pseudo uh, uh, legitimate uh, activity. Um, if you take, uh, uh, for example, um, different, uh, different uh, charities uh, and, and uh, organizations like uh, Jihad El Bina, uh, this is a, a charity that uh, funnels money, uh, this type of taxation and donations to Lebanon, to uh, uh, Hezbollah for uh, so called civil purposes. But this Jihad El Bina, uh, organization or charity is actually the main source of income for uh, infrastructure activity of Hezbollah in Lebanon, including military infrastructure uh, uh, for those uh, purposes. They help to build all the facilities uh, of Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon. So this is one example from a dozen of, uh, of, of examples uh, that uh, the way that they text their uh, supporters, text uh, Shiite communities, even those they do not support them, find themselves uh, forced to pay uh, uh, this kind of donations. By the way, uh, Boaz, I, I, I believe that one of the fundamental reasons also that Hezbollah uh, is uh, uh, active in those nefarious activities in, in our democracies is because uh, it's one of their objectives is to actually corrupt our societies. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's, it's running in the blood. <laughs> I mean, uh, they, they corrupt their own society. Uh, one of the main claims against uh, the Lebanese government today, and rightly so, is that this is one of the most corrupted government in the world, uh, maybe with the exception of the Palestinian government. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons is because of the control that Hezbollah has on this specific government. They corrupt everything they touch. And, uh, but this is uh, something that uh, meant maybe uh, to, uh, as a strategy uh, of, uh, of Hezbollah. But also <clears throat> it connects very deeply to another uh, very important element of Hezbollah that we didn't uh, elaborate a lot. There. And this is the concept of subversion. Yeah, we talked about Terrorism, we talked about uh, uh, criminal activity, uh, but subversion. Uh, this is one of the main goals of uh, uh, Hezbollah as a proxy of Iran in different parts of the world, mainly in Gulf countries, uh, Bahrain, uh, in Yemen, in Iraq, uh, in Syria, they don't need to subvert because the leadership is, is actually the Assad regime is, is, is one of their uh, part of the axis of evil, but also in other parts of the world. Now, there is a tight connection between the criminal activity, the terrorist activity, and corruption in order to create this subversive activity uh, that would lead at the end of the day, if not to topple down the regimes there, and this is the, the, the goal at the end of the day, then at least to create a civil war, uh, un, uh, uh, internal stability, uh, and uh, ungoverned uh, territories that would help them uh, to promote their goals and to export the revolution as we described uh, in the book. You were talking earlier on about uh those activities extending to Australia. Do you have any specific examples? Well, I have uh, a few examples that shows the connection. Uh, first of all, you know, one of the recent uh, clear terrorist attacks that have been conducted by Hezbollah activists <clears throat> was the attack in uh, Burgas, in Bulgaria in 2012. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> in this attack, a uh, Hezbollah activist, a suicide attacker, a Shahid, based on the intelligence that they gathered, was waiting for an Israeli uh, uh, tourist that were landing uh, in a direct flight from Tel Aviv uh, to Burgas. And he knew where they are, 
well, you can find them uh, when they are climbing a bus, a tourist bus in the parking lot of the airport in Burgas. And he explodes himself uh, next to the bus, killing seven uh, uh, innocent uh, people and uh, uh, injuring more than 30. One of the suspects that were arrested uh, was uh, uh, Miliad Farah, uh, which is an Australian citizen. So this is uh, uh, one example. In uh, 2014, <coughs> Uh, Australian police explode, uh, 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 exposed excuse me, uh, a, a global uh, uh, money laundering network uh, that was uh, working in 20 countries, uh, including uh, Sydney in, in Australia. Uh, and that led to the uh, uh, exposing three uh, drug uh, uh, laboratories uh, with the worth of hundreds of millions of, uh, of uh, dollars uh, for, that, uh, for that purposes. Um, we had uh, many instances in which uh, uh, Shiite uh, community in Australia donated uh, money uh, to uh, what at least they claim or seems uh, as uh, legitimate uh, uh, purposes in Lebanon. And uh, some of the leaders of those communities uh, publicly say that they uh, uh, support uh, Hezbollah in, uh, because it's a legitimate, they, they claim it's a legitimate uh, uh, organization uh, altogether. Uh, you can say that like many other communities around the world, you would find a lot of supporters of Hezbollah in uh, Shiite communities uh, around the world. And Australia has one of the uh, larger uh, Shiite communities in the world based on the fact that uh, Australia actually uh, brought um, many uh, immigrants, uh, uh, Lebanese immigrants, uh, many of them Shiites, uh, during the civil war in uh, in the 70s in, yeah, in the late in 70s Lebanon. that's right but uh, that uh, goes back to what we were saying earlier is that those people donating uh, donate to some of the uh, tentacles of uh, the uh, hezbollah which uh, uh, for instance in australia we have banned the external arm of hezbollah uh, but the, internally, you could even give to the militia, I believe that would be legal, because there's nothing in Australia banning the militia, the internal militia of Hezbollah. Uh, so, uh, but in New Zealand, for instance, they have banned the militia, the internal militia, they've banned the external group, uh, but there is still another hundred arms uh, that uh, have not been banned. But now, uh, uh, recently, a few months ago, Germany put a total ban on Hezbollah. And uh, I believe there must have been an element uh, that has made the Germans uh, change their mind on this. Because apart from the UK, no one else in Europe has banned Hezbollah totally. So you've got basically the United States, you've got the UK, you've got Germany. Uh, you've got partial bans on New Zealand. You've got a, a very partial ban from Australia. In Europe, the rest of Europe, uh, nothing. The French president, as you can see, uh, travels to uh, Lebanon, tries to make a deal uh, with the leadership there, ignoring the fact that they are uh, Hezbollah because he's very good friends and they're making plenty of deals with the Iranians still. Uh, so he's, uh, he's giving that a go. I mean, there is also this international hypocrisy uh, about, uh, about this whole thing <coughs> that is quite abhorrent uh, when you understand uh, what is going on. Uh, but in your opinion, what is the one element, uh, if there is one element or several, if there are several, uh, that have made uh, Angela Merkel and her government to change their mind and put a total ban on Hezbollah? Albert, uh, I think you use the right term to describe the situation. And uh, there is very clear word that describe uh, 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 how the international community behaves, including Australia, in a way even mainly Australia. 
and this is hypocrisy. Uh, and 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 let me uh, let me explain that. You have mentioned rightly so the, the states that uh, uh, designated uh, Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. Now to designate the external uh, security organization, the external branch of the organization, or the military branch of the organization. It's as if you capture a thief and you bring the, the thief to court and you accuse only the right hand of the, of the thief uh, uh, for the theft because this uh, hand actually uh, uh, took the, uh, the, the money uh, uh, from, uh, from, from the victim. Uh, this is ridiculous. Uh, Hezbollah is a hybrid terrorist organization. He ha Hezbollah has a clear chain of command. The leader of Hezbollah is being called Hassan Nasrallah. He totally controlled the organization. He controlled the external security organization, the external branch, the military branch, the social branch, the political branch, the military branch. It's all under him and his deputy named Kassim. And it, they all report to him. Now, when uh, the EU started this hypocrisy in uh, early, uh, it was 2013, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, they designated only the military arm of Hezbollah, not the political or any other parts of Hezbollah, which is still much larger than what uh, Australia did, okay? Um, the one who actually made fun of them was Hassan Nasrallah. He said, what do you mean? Uh, the military arm is a terrorist organization? Excuse me, if I'm not a terrorist organization, then the military arm is not a terrorist organization. He's right by that, but I would say the reverse. If the military arm is a terrorist organization, then Hezbollah is a terrorist organization. Uh, that's, uh, there is no other way to understand that. Australia was going even further than that in its hypocrisy the way I see it. And I refer to Australia as a close friend of Israel. I traveled a lot to uh, Australia. I have many friends in Australia. I met decision makers, many cases. Uh, you introduced me to uh, leaders of, uh, of Australia and we see many things eye to eye. But on that thing, I, I'm totally puzzled with this hypocritic approach of Australia by defining the external security organization as a, terrorist as a terrorist organization, but not the rest of, of the organization. Yes, the external security branch is the branch that they use for terrorist attacks in different parts of the world, in, in the most clear way. That's true. Thailand, uh, 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 Argentina, uh, uh, Cyprus, uh, 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 Bulgaria. That's true. Easy to incriminate them, to designate them. But if, you, if they are responsible, then the whole organization is responsible for that. You cannot differ between all, all those elements. And you know what? By adopting this hypocritic approach, you let them go on with this activity because Hezbollah is also a political organization. That's true. It's a, it's a political party. But right now, they can do both. If Australia and the rest of the world would say to Hezbollah, look, if you will abandon your terrorist activity, you would not be engaged in deliberate attacks against civilians, nor in Syria, nor in Israel, nor in Europe, nor in Australia, in any part of the world. And if you would abandon that, we would not refer to you as a terrorist organization and we, we can let you uh, fundraise in Australia, you can do other things altogether. But once you cross the red line, you are all responsible for that. You know what? Hezbollah, let me just say, just one, just one sentence. Hezbollah is a rational organization. They calculate costs and benefits. If you would impose more costs on the fact that they are conducting terrorist activities, they would change the policy. And in a way, those states that do not impose this designation on Hezbollah, they are also have to be blamed for these atrocities that are being done by Hezbollah. We totally agree. Uh, um, please tell me, uh, I go back, if you don't mind, to my question about Germany. What made Germany change their mind? Because for a long time they were following the same line as the European Union, and then suddenly they completely uh, changed tack and banned the organization. What made them change their mind? 
uh, based on uh, what we can read from open sources, they got intelligence information about the activity of Hezbollah on their soil. Uh, the recruitment activity, the training activity, the terrorist plans, and so on and so forth. But on top of that, and this is also was published, uh, they have exposed an uh, uh, extensive criminal network, or should I say networks, that adhere to uh, uh, Hezbollah activists in Germany and in Lebanon that were conducting a lot of criminal activity. By the way, many of them were involved in car theft and selling those cars as, as a used car uh, in Germany and in other countries altogether. But there was a combination of, uh, of uh, facts and intelligence uh, uh, pieces that created the puzzle that made it clear to them that now the problem is not far away from Germany, it's on German soil, and it's for the benefit of Germany, not as a favor to Israel or United States or whoever, uh, to designate the organization as a terrorist organization. So it sounds like uh, until uh, they have a direct threat to their own uh, within their own borders, states don't tend to do anything if that's the case. So maybe uh, the threats against Australia and New, Le and New Zealand are not high enough for uh, the countries of this, in this part of the world uh, to do something about it. Well, uh, if you ask me, and I'm, I'm not exposed to uh, uh, secret information, but from the little I know, I don't think that Australia has a less threats coming from Hezbollah and Hezbollah supporters than Germany. Very good. And I, I definitely take your word for it. Um, what do you think should happen with Australia? Um, do you think our government should now take an action? Uh, how do you make this happen? Because until now, the Australian government, the successive Australian governments, over the last decade has not listened. So what do we do? Again, uh, this criticism that I have towards, uh, towards Australia, uh, from my point of view, it's like, uh, it's like a, a disagreement within the family. Uh, I do see uh, Australia, Australians, and Australia uh, leadership be partisan uh, as, as uh, allies of Israel and good friends of Israel. And uh, part of uh, the liberal uh, democratic uh, uh, um, cooperation or reliance, uh, should I say, that it stands, theoretically at least, against this axis of evil. But Australia, uh, and again, be partisan, uh, traditionally has a weird uh, attitude towards the head of this uh, axis of evil, and this is Iran, and to the proxy of Iran, and this is Hezbollah. And I see this strategy, this attitude, this policy of Australia towards uh, uh, Hezbollah tightly connected to their attitude towards Iran. And they put themselves in, uh, in a very comfortable position for them, but wrongly, uh, uh, morally wrong position, in my view, and hypocritic position, uh, which is sitting on the, bo on the fence, a leg here and a leg there. Uh, they still have a tight uh, connection and they have those visits of... Uh, officials in Tehran coming back and forth. Uh, they don't want to uh, make them too mad uh, because they have uh, uh, some Australian assets kidnapped or, or whatever. Uh, they don't want to make too much fast because they might pay a price by proxies of, his, of Iran. Uh, uh, they are buying, uh, they are buying uh, quiet. They are buying peace, not peace, uh, uh, silence, I would say. Uh, this is something that I would expect from other countries, but not from Australia. I expect from Australia to stand in a very clear moral position and say, this is the red line. If you deliberately attack civilians, 
anywhere in the world, you're a terrorist organization, regardless how do you try to camouflage and surround you with pseudo-legitimate activity, if you're a state that uh, uh, use that as a proxy, this terrorist organization, you are state that sponsor terrorism and you cannot be affiliated <coughs> with us. Yeah, I see that uh, it's quite strange to observe that the Lebanese people have been hijacked by a terrorist organization. And there is this enormous explosion which absolutely decimates Beirut. There are currently, as we speak, more than 300,000 people that are totally homeless in that uh, city. And uh, the Australian government sends shipments of humanitarian goods. And the one action that they can take that will make a difference, because I think the Lebanese people in the street are totally tired of this corruption, uh, when I speak to my Lebanese friends here in Australia, most of them are for uh, the end of this organization. Uh, you know, it's very surprising that uh, no one in the Australian government uh, is prepared to do something about this. In any case, uh, you know, um, Boaz, uh, you, what you described today from... Uh, uh, from Hezbollah, especially their nefarious activities in criminality, money laundering and the rest of it, it makes it look like if jihad is a sideshow. You know, uh, we have conducted at the International Policy Institute for Counterterrorism a uh, simulation on the future of Lebanon. Uh, we just ended that two weeks ago. Actually, it was a little bit more than that. It was... Uh, uh, we ended that few days before the explosion uh, in, uh, in Beirut port. It, uh, this simulation took uh, four months uh, with experts, uh, about 15 experts, ex-Mossad, uh, Israeli security agency, um, intelligence, uh, military intelligence, uh, ambassadors and, and uh, ICT experts uh, that actually played the role of different uh, 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 actors in Lebanon itself, like the Druze, the Sunnis, the Shiites, the Christians, different parts of the Christians, but also the international community, Russia, United States, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and so on and so forth. And we try to understand what would be the future of, uh, of Lebanon um, based on three scenarios. Uh, the, the three scenarios were all connected to the fact that there is an, a, a, an enormous uh, uh, economic crisis uh, an enormous uh, health crisis, and the government, uh, which is uh, which is blamed for corruption, uh, is falling down. And, uh, and and the three scenarios were the first one uh, was that the uh, uh, the president of uh, of Lebanon actually decides to dismiss the government and create uh, an expert government disconnected from uh, different factions, including Hezbollah. By that, he deludes the uh, uh, power of Hezbollah. That led, in our scenario, at the end of the day, to a revolt of Hezbollah against the regime in Lebanon. They, did, they couldn't bear the situation that they would be pushed away from those specific importance uh, position in Lebanon. The second scenario was that uh, uh, um, Hezbollah was toppling down the government and creating a Hezbollah uh, government, uh, an emergency government created by Hezbollah and practically taking over Lebanon. This time is the first time that Lebanon is equal Hezbollah, Hezbollah is equal Lebanon. That, by the way, in our scenario, led to a war between Israel, Lebanon, and Hezbollah. And uh, the third option was after toppling down the, uh, the, the uh, government, uh, uh, Lebanon is deteriorating into a second civil war where everybody is fighting everybody. And that led uh, in our scenario to the intervenience of uh, Iran and after that even Russia uh, trying to uh, uh, take the control in uh, Lebanon and help Hezbollah in that, uh, in that uh, activity. In all of those three, and by the way, uh, we believe that the bomb in, uh, in Beirut port actually just intensify those three possible scenarios and, and show that they are very real. Um, in any case, uh, this, uh, the three outcome of those three scenarios is a very bad 
uh, uh, future and message uh, internally to the Lebanese themselves, externally to the neighbor of Lebanon, to Israel, and to the whole region of uh, uh, the uh, western side of the Middle East. Um, so I, I, I'm not very optimistic on the, on the future of Lebanon uh, in the coming years. It is a very sad situation indeed. Well, Boaz, I hope that this uh, talk today uh, will help to convince the powers that be in Australia and perhaps elsewhere to look again at the situation and uh, understand and investigate for themselves. Uh, it, it doesn't take too long once you decide to zoom in on Hezbollah. It doesn't take too long to find out uh, from open, so open sources, but the government ha also has the closed sources uh, to find out what uh, 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 lay down misere this is to just do the right thing. Thank you, Boaz. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much.